it has to be a lot to call us. Sometimes that's a crux of our job, you know, like we're, it's, it's an, it's a, such an advanced thing to, um, to employ us, you know, like, uh, things have to go really bad. They have to be really far away. They have to be very extreme because we're, we're, no one else can help you. Hello and welcome to the World Extreme Medicine podcast. I'm Fionn Davis, your host for the podcast today. I am an emergency and expedition medic and I'm really pleased to welcome Justin Shook to the podcast today. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So just a little um, update from World Extreme Medicine. Um, at the time of recording, just a few days ago, Dr. Deep C, Joe Dittori, one of our previous podcast guests, has just finished his 100-day undersea mission. So congratulations, Joe. Hope you're listening. And congratulations on completing that. Um, WEM has also just launched its Strava Club. And there's a free annual World Extreme Medicine membership up for grabs um, in the Pushing Boundaries Challenge. So get on the Strava Club make all those miles count. So, um, Justin is a pararescue jump medic, or PJ for short, with the 131st Rescue Squadron Pararescue. Super cool title, by the way, I'm pretty jealous of that. <laughs> yeah, right on. So, uh, a little bit about Justin, and um, it's kind of a long intro because he's done so much and so, so far. Um, Justin is a senior team leader, uh, paramedic, jump master, dive supervisor and instructor, an evaluator and chief of weapons and tactics at Moffett Federal Airfield in California. He started off his career in the Air Force in 1997 and attended pararescue training and graduated as top student. He's gone on to deploy in Afghanistan, Djibouti, Bagram and Iraq, as well as conducting humanitarian rescues for Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. He's developed tactics and procedures for the recovery of astronauts with NASA and in addition to all this, has taken part in several adventure races and is an AMGA guide and outdoor enthusiast. When he's not throwing himself out the back of aeroplanes, he enjoys backcountry skiing, running, rock and ice climbing and mountain biking. So that's a pretty epic intro, Justin. Um, great to yes. the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, when you read it all, I'm like, oh, it's, uh, that's just a lot of stuff. Uh, keeps me, keeps me, it's been, uh, keeps me pretty busy. So for anybody who's not sure what a pararescue jump medic is, could you just describe what that is and the kind of range of missions that you carry out? Yeah, so pararescue is, uh, it's really the only rescue service in the DOD that's specifically designed for rescue and recovery. So it entails a, a lot of different things, which is was my original interest in it anyway. So within the U.S. military, there's a lot of different uh, special operations teams. They have different jobs and, and everything. So for us, because it's primary recovery and rescue, it it falls under this full range of skills, which is which is great because I'm I'm into those things anyway. That's like as you read on the bio, of rock climbing and and running and uh, skiing and all that stuff. That's all part of the job. So the more that you are good at those things, the more you'll be good at the job itself. Um, but essentially, pararescue is to recover uh, any asset or individual personnel anywhere in the world at any time. So our vehicles to get to work include airplanes, um, you know, by uh, air, uh, helicopters, uh, boats, uh, diving, um, and then by, by land itself, uh, whether that's, you know, uh, walking, uh, skiing, Climbing, all these skills allow us to get to our job to recover either something uh, or an individual um, that may be injured or lost. Um, you know, typically in the uh, combat setting, it's, it's pilots that have ejected. Um, but in the civilian side of it, which also makes this job really fun, it's long range recovery, uh, parachuting in the oceans to, to pick up people. Um, scaling mountains to, to recover people. Um, so it's, it's, a a, a full, um, a full asset of, of, of skills to do, to do this particular job. Yeah. It's a whole range of things that you're describing there. It must take a lot of training and, um, time and investment in order to get you there. Um, before we talk about your training, uh, could you maybe just speak a little bit about how your interest started in it? You, you mentioned that you were already into rock climbing and mountaineering and things in the outdoors. How, what made you decide to get into this? 
Yeah, I think I, I think in the in the beginning, like a lot of a lot of us, like you you might crave a little bit of adventure and stuff, but you know, there's a military aspect to it. So you you kind of crave that challenge. You crave um, uh, maybe the selection. You know, can I challenge myself? Because everything starts with some type of selection before you really even know that much about maybe what you'll be doing or what the the job itself um, is. So you're you know, for me, I was interested in I was interested in a a, a life that was different a life of um uh kind of adventure something beyond myself um uh, and also sort of pushing those limits uh, you know getting into these selection things it's it's all about uh pushing until you know people quit uh, and you don't um and, and there's a huge mindset to that and that was fascinating to me at the time i just finished college so um his early 20s looked at other branches uh, and just really uh, wanted to be, the, the, you know, this was my fit because of the uh, wide range of things that you you got to do. You know, you had this uh, heavy medical aspect to it. You had this adventure part with rock climbing, skiing, diving, everything, uh, jumping, and a lot of the other branches have those. You know, have like maybe jumping or diving, but they may not have the medicine. They may not have the rock climbing. They may not have the skiing. Um, so, uh, you know, looking at all those things, I was I was I was really drawn to uh, to all of that. Yeah, when you put it like that, I, I want to do that job. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Amazing. And um, I guess, yeah, there's not many other civilian settings where you'd be able to combine all of those things together. So hence the military was, was a good fit. And you mentioned there that the selection was was pretty difficult. Um, I, I think I read somewhere on Wikipedia that uh, being selected for uh, para rescue is one of the hardest. It's one of the hardest training programs you can go through. Is that right? Yeah, I, you know, p people ask those questions all, all the time, especially with different branches, you know, everything even from uh, other places around the world. It, selection is, is in a way, all that matters. You know, you, you, in order to get in something that's important, uh, especially sort of the special operations uh, community, you have to be selected for that. You have to do something that, uh, uh, that pushes you to your mental and physical limits uh, to persevere because that's the job you're going to be put in situations where you know it's dark nighttime um you know cold all, all these environmental things uh, mental and physical stress and you have to do your work so that has to be duplicated in 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 selection um so you know the thing that that is very heavy with pararescue there's a there's a big water component so a lot of water work, uh, other branches have water as well. Um, there's a huge focus on that because we're doing stuff in the ocean. So part of the selection was a lot of water work, as well as things you could imagine, like you're running a lot, you're doing a lot of push-ups, you're, you're getting up early in the morning, you have all these tasks to do, and people are, are feeling like this job isn't for you, and they quit. Um, or, or a lot of times, or, or people get injured. Um, so you're just left with a handful of people. Um, you know, it's a high attrition rate, like, uh, you know, over 90% are failing. Um, so, you know, every week someone's leaving, uh, because they quit, someone's getting injured and you're, you're kind of going on. Uh, and once that selection is done, uh, then you actually start training Then you start going to schools and, and kind of learning the job before you even get, um, the thing that's sort of unique about pararescue is you have this, they call it a pipeline. So you get selected, um, which is more mental and physical. And then you have to go to all these courses, which you could get kicked out of as well. So it takes a few years, um, and then to include like um, uh, you know advanced medicine, uh, an actual paramedic certification. If you don't if you don't make that certification, you don't pass the test. You're still not a PJ. So anywhere along the line, you could not ever become a PJ until you know it's all done, which is you know two even three years of of training before it's uh, you actually get what we call you know your your um, parascu beret. Wow. Okay. And and so roughly from when you start the pipeline to when you finish the pipeline, do you know how many people make it all the way through? Well, you, you know, it's, uh, you know, you start with, you know, or at least, you know, in my experience, you know, 90 to 100 people, maybe 110 people kind of start out. Um, you know, I started from a, in a basic training where there's a bunch of people that are trying out, then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So we ended up, you know, with like, um, you know, about six or seven people graduated at the end. There's been classes where only one person graduated. Um, so, you know, the, the uh, and then there's been classes where 10, 15 people have graduated. Um, so it's hard to say, but, 
you know, when it's all said and done, it's uh, it's a very small percentage from going from civilian to graduating this job. Um, uh, you know, it, it's very very few people get to get to to do this to experience this. Yeah, and then you sort of mentioned it a little bit about the mindset that kind of attracted you to the job, but then that you you must have also had to develop as you go along to to be able to get through all of that training and with such a high attrition rate as well. Um, could you speak maybe a little bit about how your how your mindset's developed and and how that's been important to you in your job? Yeah, I think the mindset is is huge. Is number one. Um, you know, people. You know, you could say you're kind of born with it. You develop it. I don't know if people realize going into a selection or something like this. Um, sometimes everything that it takes, because you just don't know until you're 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 in that situation, and it's you know uh, it's impossible to decide to to know who's going to make. It. Like in the beginning of something, if you were to line a hundred people up, say that guy's going to make it, that you don't know. And typically, I think most branches would say this. You could say, well, this you know this individual that looks you know uh, physically intimidating. That's the guy that's going to make it, and that's not necessarily true. Um, because the mindset comes into it. Uh, I think what I found, um, a lot with that is, especially with like a superior athlete. And I say that in the sense of like, um, someone that you could say like, um, I don't know, a, a, a triathlon type, uh, athletes do very well in this because it's swimming and it's running and it's heavy endurance and stuff. But there's another part of that where it's like, well, this perfectly trained athlete, maybe they're taking their supplements and they're having their perfect diet and, and everything goes really well. And that gives you the ability to perform really well. And I always find it's fascinating. If you take all that away, what do you have? If all that goes away, if you don't get to eat, it's been, uh, you know, you're not getting your water. Do you change or you, do you fall apart? And that's, that's, that becomes a little bit of the physical um, mind, uh, mindset that starts to separate people. And then the other part is just, if you, um, if you were to talk to people, and I think most people would agree if, cause there's a quitting aspect, you know, I, I, I don't know if I can do this. I might, I would say that there's almost no one that at any time through most of these selections, they ever really thought about quitting because I think that's the mindset. You may not do great at stuff. You don't have to be the best athlete. You don't have to do the most pushups, be the fastest runner, anything like that. It's a lot of times it's sort of like this junkyard dog thought process well i just won't quit i'll do whatever it takes and so you can apply that to anything in life in a way it's like if something creeps creeps in like if you were to ask someone you know i want to start working out i'll start working out on monday i'll start working out once things you've already lost that battle it, you have to believe that there is no quit there is no failure there is no i may not be perfect at it i might have to work harder at it and everything but um you can really tell someone's mindset in this community um because whatever you kind of throw at them, especially later on when you when uh, you know once the selection is done and you're in it, uh, there's really no no to anything. There's weighing, you know, uh, risk versus reward and stuff like that. But it's like it's sort of a can do attitude. It's a no quit attitude. It's a never give up type of attitude. Where that comes from, maybe you're born with it. Maybe you uh, you just you you believe that you know a lot of times um, when you're young you you get into this because you believe you're you're meant for something bigger but you don't really know what that is and maybe you didn't have a lot of successes uh earlier in life perhaps you know like uh some people are great athletes some people aren't but you get in this place where it's like i i'm i'm i want to be here i want to be something better than myself and it just something changes inside of you and you see that a lot like you because you, you you're giving that opportunity to say, if i don't quit if i work hard enough if i believe in myself that starts to just come out um, you know, it's, I sometimes think about, I equate it back to like, uh, soldiers, warriors in world war two that came from, they were teachers. They, you know, they were, they had regular jobs and they were all of a sudden thrown into, you know, into war. You know, you weren't necessarily, you just, you, you were selected, you were pulled is, you know, you, you didn't volunteer for it. So you had no idea what, what would you become? And these are people that became like medal of honor winners. It's like, well, what did you do before the war well, as a teacher? But she had no idea. You had none of this. I would have never brought this would have never come out of me, but it was in me somehow. Sometimes that, that happens a lot as well. 
Yeah, and I guess something that goes along with mindset is motivation, isn't it? And and so you were talking a little bit about the refusal to quit, or you know, it's just not on the it's not on the cards, it's not an option. And is there anything that you find an extreme motivator aside from that uh, sort of the sort of drive to succeed or drive to maybe for some people it's make your family proud or you know was there anything like that that would that would have been a sort of motivator for you or was it just to challenge yourself and to really just bring the best out of yourself you know i think in the beginning um it does become very individual i mean you could say you know some people um you know could say well i uh, you know from my upbringing or, or my high school or whatever um people wouldn't believe what i'm doing right now and you know I, I think that comes a little bit of a small town thought process like look at look what i'm doing and that can be motivating um you know for me individually i uh i was just excited to challenge myself i i, I think my motivation was 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 probably to also not uh I wouldn't say to not quit because it never came into my mind, but it's like there's a lot of unknown of uh, of doing something that's that's hard, that people are quitting around you. And I don't want to be one of those people. So the motivation becomes um, also you kind of look at what the end result is, you know, especially when it gets hard in a selection or something. It's like, well, I want to be I want to have this. I believe in this job. I believe in this mission. Now, that's a big part of it, too. You know, like the, our mission uh, is 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 rewarding in a sense because you're you need to be at your best when someone's at their worst you know so all this stuff kind of like this is the beginning to that if i get through this then i get to be one of those people that maybe saves a life so you could when it gets dark you know that's a big motivation like i, I need i need to get through this is just the work it's the work to get to the skills to get to the job to hopefully make a difference someday you know you can you can hone that a lot um yeah, so it's a lot, a lot of different motivations for everything. Yeah, I, I think those are some great reasons and some really interesting insights into mindset. Um, with the with the um, training that you have had to do, um, a lot of that, I imagine, is laying a foundation to be able to perform, um, not just uh, to look after yourself, but then to be able to get to these remote, hostile places and then to look after your patient as well. So there's a lot of read across that uh, in terms of um, healthcare professionals and being able to look after ourselves, maybe not in such a brutal way, like physically, we're not maybe that challenged when we go to hospital. <laughs> um, but there is in terms of mentally, you know, we really do have to look after ourselves. And I, I, re I just wanted to ask what sort of um, strategies or things do you adopt in order to be able to maintain your own operational capability when you're deploying on a mission? Yeah, I mean, I, it is a great, great question as far as falling under preparedness. Um, and I think you could put this in a, a, a big spectrum of, especially in the medical community, uh, if in a hospital environment, you know, your preparation is, is uh, it could be physical in a way, like you want to stay healthy, you want to get enough sleep and everything, but eventually sleep goes away, you know, you've got long hours, you're working overnight and stuff like that. And so then the mental aspect comes in. And I think a lot of that is, preparedness as much as you can do um uh, outside of of uh of the real thing you know it you know, falls under training so the more you're in the books the more that you've practiced something the more that gives you confidence and i think the confidence then you know allows you to be as best you can uh you know for your patient you know in our world um, you know, training is everything. And a lot of times people always say like, you don't really rise to the occasion, you fall back on what your training is. So if you, you know, if you stayed in the gym, if you, you know, did your running, like, okay, I'm physically, I'm ready. But I read my books, I looked over these, um, um, uh, the drugs, I looked over the medical procedures, like I, I feel sharp with that. I've, I've practiced enough. I've, I've done, um, uh, you know, medical procedures in, uh, you know, cramped areas uh, in, in, you know, I practice my IVs w uh, under NVGs. I, I did that work. So then when the moment comes um, where I need to perform, I'm a little more relaxed. Uh, so when all that out, when all those other things come in, like, uh, you know, which always happens again, like the late nights, the shift that went longer than you think it did, the, the you know, the mass cash that all of a sudden comes in, you know, in our world, you know, the, um, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, having to jump into the, uh, the ocean, um, and having to stay there a long time, uh, you know, all those things, the more prepared you are, the more you're prepared for the, when the outside stuff starts to come in and, and, and affect you. Um, so everything's training, you know, everything is, everything's training. Do you guys do much in terms of, um, I've heard, I've heard this from athletes and I've started to creep into the medical field, but, um, like visualization, um, and I'm thinking in terms of, you know, you've got a really difficult procedure or the conditions are not ideal. I think for you guys, maybe you're on a ship that's moving in the dark and in a cramped space or something like that. Um, is there much role for sort of picturing in your mind what you're going to have to do going through the steps kind of virtually before you have to go and do it well it's it, a little bit a little bit there is you know i i think there could be more of that in a way you know like i think we we tend to just you know we're training hard you know the the mental ass so when i uh, i ran in college and we used to do visualization before a race where you'd lay down and you'd, you'd walk through the whole race in your mind before the race happened uh, and that was very powerful um I think what I see a lot of times in our community uh, is maybe not visualization prior to like once a moment happens, you're in it. You, again, you fall back on your training, but like, um, like I'll see prior to, let's say we're doing a, a jump, you know, parachute jump it inherently is dangerous. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. So I'll see a lot of guys in the back of the, um, uh, of an airplane with their eyes closed going through emergency procedures. So you're kind of anticipating the stuff that could, you know, you're preparing yourself for the what if. Hopefully you jump and it's great and there's no problems. But there's a lot of visualization that goes into those things. Like you've trained enough that you know how to jump, but if it doesn't go right, that's where heavy visualization come in. So I'll see guys eyes closed, just going through procedures, you know, closing your eyes, going through your things, pulling your stuff. Um, you know, what happens if this, you know, this repetition, um, getting your mind right, you know, 10 minutes before you're going to jump. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. I really like that. Um, something you mentioned about, uh, sometimes you might be with your patients for quite a while. I think, um, when you're deployed and I, when I when I sort of was learning a little bit about what our rescue jump medics do um, and you you mentioned jumping into the ocean and then I think um, deploying to patients on tankers and, and things like that and I imagine you can be on those ships or in those situations for quite some time um, in terms of like a prolonged field care situation right um, what what sort of lessons have you learned about that? Because that's obviously quite different to a sort of standard paramedic job, isn't it? Yeah, I think the uh, it, that's probably the the biggest separation, or or the most um, one of the most challenging parts of our job uh, is long term. Uh, medical care. I mean, that's really what we try and focus on. Like, we have more immediate things sometimes, but what we really hang our hat on, especially our particular team in, in our location is um, we do long range uh, parachute insertion into the ocean, 1500 miles, 2000 miles off the coast uh, to injured uh, people. Uh, we've, we've done it off the coast of California. We've done it down in Mexico. So that really changes things. And, and we've, we've spoke a lot um, at conferences because it's a fascinating thing for medical personnel to, to see the changes in what that means. So, you know, when, when you go to a hospital, you have all your stuff right there. You might be there for a while, but you could take a break. Um, you can, you have all your medical uh, extra people there that you could call in. You can get extra gear. When we jump, we bring everything with us. So we typically jump, you know, just a few people with, over 100 pounds of gear to include uh, blood, uh, to you know monitors, uh, uh, advanced uh, drugs that we might have, cardiac medicine, uh, pain medication, you know all all your standard uh, sort of you know splinting gauzes, uh, IVs. Um, but we're jumping monitors and we're jumping vents, so we're jumping stuff for uh, extreme uh, injuries. We got to bring it all, so we know obviously what the a little bit of the injuries. And if someone was you know, uh, painting inside the ship uh, and smoking a cigarette, and then all of a sudden, 
a big explosion. Um, you know, people fall. Uh, people have you know uh, almost amputated limbs, uh, fractures, ultra you know, uh, uh, medical pro you know um, uh, sepsis, uh, heart attacks, any a whole array of things that you could imagine. The people that are on ships for a long time. So when we jump to these in individuals, we have to bring everything with us, and our hospital bed is where we make it which is, these are the things that become creative which is also the funnest part uh, or, or one of the it's a fun challenging creative part of the job so um you know i recently was on a mission where we jumped uh and there's also language barriers so we jumped to a mexican uh fishing vessel with uh severe injuries on two individuals where a cable had shattered their um uh, their legs, uh, tib fib fractures, uh, femur uh, fractures, and down in the bottom where you sleep, down in that hole, is a, you know there's bunk beds. That's our hospital. That's where we brought all our gear, 100 pounds of gear. We set it all up. We put them next side by side in two beds. Um, we are hanging IVs. We're changing changing dressings. Like that's our whole hospital, and we're there for three or four days. We don't know how long we're going to be there because the the ship is moving at a speed that um, is allowing them to get closer to shore, to whatever. Now, we also have helicopters then. So the jump goes because that's the long range. So we're jumping in unknown to the ocean. So everything we have on us, which is the medical, our own personal stuff, how we're going to sleep, uh, a little bit of food, all those things, there's a lot of unknown to that. We need to be able to survive for three or four days, waiting for a helicopter to get closer to pick up, waiting for to get to shore. Um, and our hospital bed, our area is... The environment so you, you you try and clean it just like you would you're cleaning floors you're asking for uh you know changing um changing sheets if you can you but you're also being creative in the sense of uh hey we need to raise this individual's leg uh what do we have i have a shoe box okay do we, we need some rope or something uh, how about some shoelaces like you you grab whatever you can't bring everything so you have to use what's in the environment so those are the differences and that's really the specialty of long-range medical care is you jump everything you need and then you need to think outside of the box to make things last to make things work to and to make patients comfortable and to treat whatever their things are their injuries are um until you can get to advanced care and just leading on from that, um, do you find that you ever have to ration your resources um, in terms of, I'm thinking maybe your medication, you can only jump so much, or um, yeah. also you are a resource as well. Um, and I guess you would have to rotate and make sure you're getting enough sleep and everything if you're out there for three or four. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the whole, um, I guess, that's the specialty that we live under is you were jumping a small team and you have to manage, you know, uh, not only your patients, but your team itself. Uh, they need food. They need sleep. Um, they need to take care of themselves a little bit. So typically, we'll put some type of rotation. Hey, go sleep for two hours. Hey, you watch your patient. Then we switch out. You know, we're constantly working that. We're also, you know, constantly uh, getting you know communication. You know, advanced technology. Um, you know, through satellites to bring information, patient updates back to our. Uh, home uh, station talking to uh, the doctors that are there hey this is what we got what do you think and then we're talking to um, you know the helicopters or the sh people on shore like how far out are we we're a couple days out can the helicopter get to us we're managing all that stuff um, and it can be exhausting but I, that's also part of the training that's part of the mindset that's part of why you went through selection so when the moment happens where it's been a few days and you haven't eaten any, very much and you haven't slept very much, you're still able per, to perform because someone really needs you. And and that's really the essence of the job. Yeah, and um, I think you mentioned about language barriers as well. Um, if you're jumping to a variety of ships, I imagine you get all sorts of different languages. And how do you work around that? Yeah, I would say most of my missions have all been uh, a language barrier. Um, the last one that I had mentioned was, was uh, you know, everyone speaking Spanish. Now we did have someone that jumped in that um, spoke Spanish. That was super helpful. Um, but uh, we have also uh, jumped into languages that nobody spoke. So we we will jump in like a honestly like our phones, a like Google Translate. You know, you it's amazing how much nonverbal you can do, you know, with with stuff. But we we bring in jump in on iPad, a Google Translate or other type of translation stuff that we can communicate with the crew, communicate. So we do the best we can um, or we try and get someone uh, online 
that, uh, you know, speaks, um, speaks a language so we can kind of go through an interpreter. Sometimes that works. Um, but again, we're, we can really be on our own. The Google Translator has worked really, uh, very well. Um, we did have a mission that was to a, a Chinese, um, it was a transport of, of equipment. And it was, uh, they spoke Mandarin Chinese. And we happen to have a, uh, PJ, who is also an ER physician that also speaks Mandarin Chinese. So we had him go on the mission. Yeah, brilliant. Use those resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you, you mentioned about satellite communications with the doctors uh, in mm -hmm. the US, um, do you ever find yourselves in situations where you maybe need to be talked through a procedure over the phone. Um, maybe it's something you've not done before, or it's something rare, rare or unusual, and you kind of maybe can't get them to shore because they're either too far away, or the weather's bad, or you know, and they just need that thing to be done then. Um, yeah, um, you know, it's 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 tough to, you know, we're really getting trying to get advice, so we're either you know, satellite texting, satellite communication, if we can talk, you know, we're bringing um, a satellite phones, which again, sometimes they're hit and miss, sometimes we're able to speak, sometimes we're not. So uh, it's very helpful to have to be able to get information back. But uh, a lot of times that's, that's also the essence of the long term care is like, if you can't, you're on your own, so you still need to figure it out. Um, very, very helpful with uh, uh, advanced stuff. Um, we've had sepsis uh, patients where it's like we, we, you know, we have questions about antibiotics. You know, this is all we brought. We had, um, uh, we've had some where, uh, again, I was on one where we, we really needed to push a lot of uh, pain meds and antibiotics, but we ran out and you know, we don't have so much. So it's like, okay, we used this amount of antibiotics. Can we start using our, our secondary, you know, we call back, can we mix this a little bit? Yeah, no problem. You, you can mix that. So we're getting those as far as like procedures, you know, that would be, that's, 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 um, that's kind of what we train for, you know, like we know what we're getting into. Um, it may be something that we don't do all the time, but we're jumping in as much information as we can. Again, books, um, you know, our medical handbooks, uh, try and get information as much as we can from, uh, uh, you know, at home station before we launch. Um, and then you're kind of doing it live. Um, we've done uh, pretty advanced debridements um, from infections on, on uh, ankles and legs that we just had to debride. Um, you know, those are, those are skills we're not doing all the time. Um, but you hope that, you know, uh, you've, you've, you've had that discussion. Uh, you can remember back a little bit. Um, and, but yeah, uh, it, when you're out there, it's, it's, it is you. Uh, but it's very helpful if we can um, get updates from the, from the docs back home. Yeah, and like you said, when you, maybe when you're doing those things that maybe you don't do that often, um, that's where the training really kicks in. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and it happens all the time because it's not like we're, you know, we're not a, a, an ambulance service at a hospital, you know, ER service that, you know, you're getting it every day, like, that's great, you're, you're, you're running codes, you're seeing patients, everything, like, you, it has to be a lot to call us, sometimes that's a crux of our job, you know, like, we're, it's, it's an, it's a, such an advanced thing to, um, to employ us. You know, like uh, things have to go really bad. They have to be really far away. They have to be very extreme because we're, we're no one else can help you. You can't get anyone else there. Who's who can jump to a ship with all the medical gear? You know, you start looking at that list. It's like, well, only these guys. So we don't get to do it that often because that's not happening all the time. So, you know, these big advanced jump missions might be only one or two a year, and you have to prepare all year round for that moment. Uh, which can be hard, you know, you can get complacent a little bit, you know, ah, I don't know about that, you know, I, I'm not going to look at that, you know, we have medical refreshers that go every year, you try and you try and soak up as much as you can, you try and be a sponge during those times. And then, you know, other there's, there's a lot to do, you know, we're, we're doing tactics, we're learning, you know, keeping our jump skills, doing our dive skills, you know, obviously trying to keep up our medical skills, there's always going to be stuff like, man, I haven't, I haven't seen this in a long time. Um, and that's 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 part of the gig yeah i was going to ask you about that actually when you're training for such a variety of environments and missions and and you know really complex medical stuff sometimes um how do you how do you stop yourself from from just getting complacent or getting fatigued from, from all the training that you're doing for that for that moment maybe once or twice a year how, how do you sort of motivate yourself uh, 
Well, it's sort of jack of all trades, master of none is sort of the, you know, the joke that we have. Like, I, got, I wish I was an expert at everything. Uh, and you can't. So you manage, you know, some people are, are um, I, I, you know, are better at other things, are better at some things than, than you know, like, um, you know, you might be a, a big ropes guy, you know, you climb on, you climb on your own, uh, you're really into it. So maybe you don't practice the ropes that much because it's, you know, you're really good at that. Some people, you know, we have uh, guys that are part time that work at uh, fire departments. Uh, obviously, we have a we have a part time guy that's an ER doc. He's probably not going to practice too much basic medicine. He's not probably going to do random IVs, uh, you know, during the day uh, to keep his IV skills up. Like, it's probably not necessary. Um, some guys are really into shooting, so they might, uh, you know, feel like they don't need, um, you know, they're they're shooting more on their own, or 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 it's a, you know they have a background in it or whatever. So really what you try and do is you try and focus on the things that you aren't comfortable with doing you know you try and like incorporate that now we have a whole training program for a whole year and we try and hit a little bit of everything but it's also on your own if you haven't been in the books on medicine that's your job to try and to try and do that a little bit um it's a constant it never gets there's never a complacency because it's too important to be complacent you may wish you could do a little bit more you could you may wish that you had a little bit more time i mean i wish i was on the climbing wall a little bit more it's been a while um but it's you're never complacent you just never feel like i i just you're everyone's always craving for more give me more give me more i want to go on this course i want to go to this course well we can't go to everything you know um there's still admin you know there's still like logistics of admin day-to-day -day stuff that sometimes uh occurs uh but the complacency never, um, I would I would say, is it, it very rarely sets in because it's 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 too important that you might get called, and you don't want to be the guy that gets called um, and isn't prepared. That's the worst thing in the world. Yeah, it's really it's really inspiring to hear things like that, and that's why I really enjoy doing these podcasts. Actually, is to to hear people who are really high performing individuals and in high performance teams and people are never um never big braggers about it or anything like that everybody that i've spoken to in this sort of that situation is always really humble and really keen to drive their own self-development and never gets complacent and it, it's it's just really um inspiring to hear um so yeah thanks thanks for that little motivator for me get back in the books find out what i don't know <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, we'll move on a little bit to some of the, some of the environments that you uh, deployed to. So um, it, you have recently been working to train some of the Ukrainian forces. Is that right? Yeah, we have a partnership um, this, uh, with our team without in uh, California. Um, so kind of before things had kicked off over the last couple of years, um, it was it was. Um, uh, we were trying to get over there to uh, do training. You know, we have, uh, you know, similar groups over there that are um, trying to be, get more medical. They're trying to do more jumps. You know, it's a, like kind of like a Ukraine PJ team. Um, and that partnership allows us to uh, do some training, to do joint training, um, you know, to, uh, to work with, you know, to work with them um, uh, from, at all levels. Uh, so uh, over the last probably decade, you know, at least a couple times, you know, I've, I've been able to participate, go over there. Um, there's been some large um, worldwide exercises. You know, a few years ago, they had a huge exercise there where people from all over the world went there. There was, you know, planes, helicopters. We're doing our part. We're doing our training. You know, we're part of the exercise. So we're, we're doing a little bit of training and we're doing things live. Like we jumped all together. Um, we did a mass cash uh, training event together. So uh, you know, everyone's kind of, you know, exercises are great. Um, obviously things have changed, you know, because now it's this, this act of war has, um, you know, there isn't, you know, no one's going over there to do training, so to speak, like they're, they're in it right now. So the support comes in different ways. Uh, but in the past, uh, this was a great opportunity to, uh, do a partnership with, with, uh, with them, um, again with uh these big exercises and then in the smaller ones we went over there and got to meet teams and and uh and share knowledge i imagine you must get requests like that fairly often from countries trying to develop that sort of capability do you find it do you find it's a two-way street do you, do you i mean do you get 
do you learn something from them as well or is it mainly mainly you guys instructing them well uh, well yeah so i think i've been lucky enough to be involved in a lot of these uh, additional training things uh the partnership like the ukraine partnership is is a, on a larger scale um but like i've uh, i've gone down to uh columbia um and it, this was just set up where it's it's kind of joint training uh the colombian um their they their sf team um wants to get better at uh, high angle ropes access you know in the jungle and everything like that so uh we were able to you know through state department stuff like that you know uh set up joint training where a couple of us went down um and we go to a base down there and we're training ropes we're training high angle we're, we're training with them so we spent a couple weeks down there and uh, I, I guess in a way that's that is more of us giving our skills to um, help them develop uh, their skills. Um, I mean, they're doing things, you know, especially live jungle warfare that we're not involved in at all. You know, they're they're uh, they're involved in things that you know constantly. So we learn from them as far as that environment, and we're giving our skills, which is the reason we're down there. Like we're there to, you know, in a uh, in a. Uh, uh, you know, an environment, you know, again, on a base or something, um, teaching high angle, teaching ropes and everything. So I've been, uh, I've also been to places like Mongolia, again, um, just really good joint par partnership type stuff, going to another country, um, bringing a few different assets or, or um, expertise together to help um, Mongolian army um, uh, do river river crossing kind of work with uh because they're going to deploy somewhere where they needed to have um some skills on protecting the borders to cross rivers with big uh equipment so that was another great uh so all we were doing there was just really teaching people how to drive some small zodiac boats because that's part of our expertise going down rivers you know we are um uh, also doing water confidence so we can bring all that stuff so Anytime you go to another country, you're learning their customs, you're learning about them, and that experience is so rewarding. Um, so yeah, we're sharing a little bit of our knowledge. That's the reason we went over there, like we're teaching ropes, we're teaching some water work, we're teaching how to do some boat stuff um, to better their capabilities. But those are the some, some of the most cherished memories that I have is, is working with the, uh, and it's, it's, I always find it interesting how similar everyone is. And I'm going to another country I've never been and working with guys, you know, that in a way are similar, like they had to do some type of selection to get into a specialized career. Uh, and it's the same personality, it's the same jokes, you know, it's the same, you know, like you said, the, you know, the, the, the same type of personality, sort of humble, but they're doing these great things. It's, same guys uh and that's always very fun yeah it's a, i bet it's an amazing sense of community and a really kind of um you're already self-selected to be similar people aren't you because like you said you've already mm. been through the same selection process or and sort of formative experiences and things yeah um i think uh we mentioned in the intro we, you did a little bit of work with nasa in developing tactics for astronaut recovery could you tell us a little bit about that yeah so as things have changed uh with different deployments over the last few years um uh there's different companies are um you know going into space so we pararescue has always been involved with uh space shuttle uh, astronaut recovery you know for, for decades so it only seemed natural that we would be part of um developing or basically developing recovery ttps uh so those techniques um you know, uh, there's there's a lot of different people, you know, from uh, people that are in Florida closer to um, the space uh, station, uh, as well as uh, operators like myself to get a chance to do this training. So, uh, you know, what you're looking at is how do you deploy, you know, if, if, if the astronauts come down and they land, let's say, in water, you know, they have this pod there, uh, you know, someone needs to go get them. Uh, so those techniques, we practice those, you know, people are developing, what's the best way to do that, you know. So again, we have the jump capability, we'll parachute out of, um, you know, familiar aircraft with familiar um, uh, boats and recovery. Uh, again, all of our medical gear, stuff that we're already good at. Now we just have to put it into the best way to um, use those 
uh, new tactics and techniques for for the astronauts. So we train that way. We we jump out. Um, we're you know we're doing stuff with uh, checking for radiation. You know, so we have to learn those uh, techniques. Um, how to board the the pods themselves um, in in rough seas. How to really create a little water world. So that's sort of the um, that's sort of the procedures for that. Like we need to jump a team out. We need to bring boats with us. We need to bring medical gear. We need to be able to board the pod itself. We need to be able to secure it, um, keep it from moving. And then we need to be able to make access. And then once we get in, the astronauts themselves who just came from space, uh, they're, they'll have medical concerns. So we're, um, you know, what's the best way to treat them, uh, to get them out of the pod, to get them onto, um, uh, our platform that we created and to wait for ships to come and get them, you know, so it's sort of like this, this whole, um, uh, you know, from the start, like, okay, they're in the water. How do we finally get out? You know, we're the first one to make access to them. If that's the case, if they end up in that situation. Uh, so, you know, helping develop that, um, uh, was, was, was great. And I'm just trying to picture that in my head. So they've, is this a kind of emergency crash landing situation or is this a kind of routine getting the astronauts back to Earth? Or It could be both. It could be both. You know, if something was to go uh, wrong where they needed to come back, the pod needed to come back down, um, it could be an emergency thing. It could be just the water landing itself. Uh, we get put on alert for these things. So let's say... Um, it was initiated that we needed to do the recovery. Uh, we're already on alert. We're already either flying or close by. Um, and uh, and then this whole thing, uh, it gets initiated. And we kind of know what to do because we've practiced this a little bit. We've read the the, um, the TTPs for it, um, you know, how we're going to board, um, even down to the medical stuff, like what each, each astronaut is supposed to get. You know, are they getting an IV? Are they getting motion sickness medicine? Um, are there... Um, and then once we get them out of the pod, you know, we're bringing our um, our satellite infor uh, our satellite communication so we can communicate with the next level, which is you know either a helicopter or a ship or or whatever the recovery process is. Yeah, it's a whole chain of events. Yeah, safety, yeah. Okay. Um, so just moving on a little bit from that. Uh, all these cool missions and, and amazing places that you get to go and do, and, um, you know, lives you get to save um, in a very, very real sense. It's, sometimes um, people say, oh, you're an emergency medicine doctor. You get you must save lives all the time. That's not really true. Like 90, 99 percent of the time, I, I don't I don't think. <laughs> but um, you really do get to make a massive difference to these people in pretty dire situations. How, how do you then debrief that with the team and, and bring out the learning and things? Uh, so yeah. Improving the future. Yeah, I would say you know the debrief is like any. I mean, you could say business or especially in the military, like everything's a debrief. And when did something we debrief, we talk about it. So it's, uh, it's it's just ingrained. Like no matter what we do, even at the smallest thing, we're going back and talking about it. Like did we make any mistakes? How can we do better? Going around the room, everyone has an input. Everyone has a say. Um, how did you feel it went? Like even if we do a simple training event. Um, let's say it's a simple jump, you know, uh, we'll start at the beginning. How did the brief go? How did we, did you feel that, you know, you knew what was going on? Um, how was the timeline? Was it condensed? Did you feel rushed? You know, all those things matter so we can always improve. Like the debrief is the foundation. It's, uh, uh, as foundational of any training event, especially mission. Then it, then it becomes, you know, we're also writing things. So not only are we doing a debrief on the simplest thing, uh, simplest tasks, you know, how did it go? How did everybody feel? Can we learn from this? Any mistakes? Um, and we always say it's, you know, it's, it's professional. It's not personal because sometimes you got to call people out like, man, you, you really screwed this up. You know, what's the deal? Uh, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was tired from the night before or whatever. Like you got to get real with it. That's the best, that's the best way to have a debrief is to keep it at this professional. So people don't take things personally. And for the most part, especially in the military, that works pretty well. Um, missions and things that, uh, again, like when we do these big jump missions, this gets written up then. So a, a full after action report gets written, you know, uh, is, 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 as much as you can. So then we can store that and then that gets stored so we can talk about it in training. We can pull it out like, Hey, based on the last mission, you could pull up a, 
an after action report after a really good debrief. So now it's documented like, okay, these guys jumped a thousand miles out and they, they needed this or they, you know, uh, this would have been helpful. So keeping those records matter. And then, uh, yeah, of course, after everything we do, we, we, we talk about, uh, things that went right and things that didn't go right. Yeah. I, I really like that. Keeping it professional, not personal, because that can be a real challenge when you're talking about negative feedback. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and then with the with the storage of your feedbacks and keeping it as a document, um, is that accessible to like other teams that maybe weren't involved with the job or so that they yeah, can maybe say, sure. oh yeah, we're going to do a similar job. Like, what did these guys do? Oh, they did this. Like, that worked well. Can, can they? Abs- absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I there. You know, there's not like one. Uh, we're, we're always working that. There, there are there are some share points that have a ton of stuff, so guys can always access that. But you know, if there's something small like an individual n- mission that's only specific to that unit, you can always call that unit and be like, "Hey, you guys did something that was similar. Maybe what we're going to do, or we just want to learn something." Um, it's super easy to share files. I remembered what I was going to ask you about the astronauts. I had a question in my mind and it was with the um, development of sort of private space travel and, you know, Elon Musk and all of this. Um, mm-hmm. that, it, so I imagine if they have a emergency, it would probably be you guys that's going to have to go and, and rescue them. Are you, are you having any input into their processes or their protocols or anything like that? Or have there been discussions about how that will work? A little bit, yeah. Uh, you know, things have changed. You know, so I'm only speaking from a little bit of my experience a, a number of years ago when, when exactly like uh, you were saying, um, uh, it was with SpaceX. Uh, we've we had the opportunity to go down to uh, uh, down in uh, LA area um, to go to where they're developing a lot of stuff. So what we went down there to do was. Um, you know, see some of the development, you know, the pods themselves and everything. But our specific thing was we just wanted to have a little bit of time to um, work on to, to, to feel around the pods themselves. Like, hey, we're, if we had to bring someone out from the from the top, you know, we'd have to set up a little bit of a rope system. Can we play around with that a little bit? And it's not in the water. It's just sitting there at the, at the, at the um, in the building. And we had a chance to do that a little bit. We also had a chance to like, OK, so how do we backboard a, a astronaut and just bring them out, you know, the 10 feet or so, like that's not that easy. It's very small and cramped. So we kind of practiced on a benign uh, pod in the development center uh, to work a little bit of those tactics, you know, to, to, um, to see, Hey, this is, this will work. This will not work. So we had a little bit of experience with that. Again, this is a few years ago. I had a chance to do that, but um uh yeah we we did some stuff with that yeah interesting yeah um, and then as we just sort of close on the podcast um i wondered if you had any sort of best cases best rescues sort of thing that kind of stand out in your mind from your career that you could maybe talk about well i think uh i think you know things that become memorable or rewarding like i was talking a little bit about uh, working with, uh, you know, other countries, it's super rewarding, um, you know, uh, working with Mongolia, uh, we had a chance, this was training in a way, we're training them, but it's, 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 it's all real in the sense of the work that we're doing, you know, we, we went to an area very north, very isolated, very remote, because we're working on a very remote river, and you, you're doing your training during the day that you're, you're coming up with, but the culture that the the community there they wanted to share mongolian culture with you so they set up a whole thing where um their their song uh their dance uh, uh you know their culture of riding horses bow and arrows they set up a whole thing for us so uh even to the food how they cooked food how they cook with the, uh, the hot rocks that you also put in your hands to warm your hands and you're also cooking with it um the beautiful um, dance of their culture, um, we got to see that. So we got to share all that during train uh, during training. Um, those are some of the most rewarding um, experiences. Is going to another. Uh, that's so rewarding in the job. Yeah, there's there's of course just you know saving lives is is the bread and butter. And um, you know I was talking about the the the, the Mexican uh, fishing vessel. Where there's two individuals there. We were there a very long time. Uh, very rewarding to 
um, to be part of that, um, uh, you know, and, and to help someone that really needs their help. But again, I fall back on the relationships of these of these events. So we have training and we're learning about cultures and we're meeting people and we're feeling, you know, um, that that bond. But again, even like with the um, the mission, the jump mission to uh, in the Mexican fishing vessel, the crew and the people were so warm to us, the way they fed us, the way that we um, learned about each other. And then the strength of that culture, the strength of the two individuals that were injured, you know, you bond with that. And I think that's the most rewarding part of this job. So you could say like, you guys jumped in there, we pushed IVs, you pushed, uh, you know, drugs. Yeah, you do that medicine, but you also take ice cubes and rub their forehead because they're, because they're hot, because they're, you know, their bodies are, are, are fighting, you know, you're, um, you know, uh, you know, you're trying to figure out how to help them go to the bathroom. You're uh, cooling them down with fans. You're making them comfortable. Like that's that's the best part of this job is is those connections with uh, you know people that you work with overseas, and then the people that you go to to save or to treat or to take care of. Um, those are the memories that I have from this job that are that are absolutely the most rewarding. That is really like wholesome to hear, actually, because often, you know, people might say best case ever, it was this juicy trauma and this is really sexy medicine and we were cracking chests and all of this stuff. But actually, like the human connection and the satisfaction you get from that. Um, yeah, I, I can totally relate to that. Sometimes the best thing I do for a patient is make them a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You kind of forget that. And there's no you don't train for that in a way. You know, it, it comes out and you're like, wow, this is this was amazing. Yes, you, you train for a lot of the action stuff. And and that's great, too. Um, in a way, it's you know, you're in auto mode. You know, you're, you're doing the medicine, you're doing the work or whatever. Um, but man, that that connect, that human connection is in a way I would feel like a lot of people also get into this job for for that reward as well. Definitely. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, it's been a really fascinating discussion and really interesting to hear about your experiences. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to me on the podcast. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, this was a wonderful uh, time. I, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so for lots more inspiring educational content, have a look on the World Extreme Medicine website. And of course, there's other podcasts uh, and there will be more coming up in the future as well. And look out for the webinars. And as I mentioned at the start, get on the Strava Club. I am way down the leaderboard, hoping to work my way up there. But uh, maybe we'll see you on there as well. I'm pretty sure your, your stats are going to be insane. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to see it all. Appreciate it. This is great. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please feel free to rate, review and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to. Please also head over to the World Extreme Medicine website where you can find more engaging content on extreme medicine webinars and indeed the collection of courses from our global network, including humanitarian, disaster relief, expedition, space, military, tactical and performance medicine. Thanks again.